Hey crew, it's Ben, and I'm back with another some more Socrates. Today we are going to be diving back into the works of Plato. We are in book nine, we are halfway through, and we have just had the argument as to which man would be the more pleasant, the more happy. And so, let's continue into the text. So, of the three pleasures, would the one that belongs to the part of the soul we learn with be the most pleasant? And would the life of the person in whom this part rules be the most pleasant life of the three? How could, <clears throat> sorry, how could it be otherwise, said he? The man of intelligence is the one who has complete authority to praise his own life. And what comes second, and what pleasure comes round according to the judge, I asked. It is obviously the pleasure of the military type who loves honor since this is closer to the lover of wisdom than the pleasure of the lover of profit. Then it seems that the pleasure of the lover of profit comes last. Indeed, said he. These would constitute two arguments in succession and two victories for the just over the unjust. Let the third, in Olympic fashion, be dedicated to the savior, Olympian Zeus. Consider this carefully. The pleasure of others apart from the pleasure of the man of intelligence, is not completely true, nor is it pure. It is a mere shadow drawing. It seems to me to have, it, as it seems to me, I have heard from one of the wise, and indeed, this next overthrow of the unjust would be the greatest and most decisive of all. Very decisive, but what do you mean? I will discover this, if you answer questions while I carry out an inquiry. Ask your questions then. Then tell me, said I, do we not maintain that pain is the opposite of pleasure? <clears throat> Very much so. And do we not also say that being neither in pleasure nor in pain is possible? It is indeed. Would you describe this as a middle state? between these two, a respite of the soul from both? Quite so. Now, do you recall the utterances of sick people and what they say when they're ill? What sort of utterances? That nothing is actually more pleasant than being healthy, but they were unaware prior to their illness just how pleasant it is. I remember. And do you not hear people who are gripped by some huge pain saying that nothing is more pleasant than cessation of pain. I do hear that. And I believe in lots of other situations like this, you notice that people in pain, rather than praising enjoyment, praise absence of pain and respite from this sort of thing is the greatest pleasure. Yes, said he, that this respite is probably pleasant and enjoyable then. And when someone's enjoyment comes to an end, respite from the pleasure will be a source of pain. Probably. So respite, which we just which we said just now is in between pleasure and pain, will on occasion be both. So it seems. <clears throat> so it seems. But <clears throat> is it possible for something that is neither to become both? I do not think so. And indeed, the pleasure that arises in the soul and the pain too are both movements of some sort, are they not? Yes. And did not whatever is neither painful nor pleasant turn out just now to be a repose between the two? So it did. Now, how could it be right to think that not being in pain is pleasure? And absence of enjoyment is pain. It should not be. So this is not the case, said I, but it appears so. Respite on occasion appears pleasant in comparison with pain and painful in comparison with pleasure. But there is nothing sound in any of these appearances in relation to the truth about pleasure. They are, rather, a sort of enchantment. Well, that is where the argument is heading, is indicating. <clears throat> then, 
Look at the pleasures that do not originate in pains, so that you do not come to believe, in the present case, that this is the natural state of affairs, that pleasure is indeed the cessation of pain, and pain the cessation of pleasure. Where shall I look, and what sort of pleasures do you mean? Well, although there are many other examples, I would like you to pay particular attention to the pleasures associated with smells. For these suddenly become extraordinarily intense without any preceding pain, and when they cease, they leave behind no pain at all. Very true. So let us not believe that being quit of pain is pure pleasure, or that being quit of pleasure is pain. Let us not. And yet, the greatest and most numerous of these so-called pleasures that extend through the body as far as the soul are of this form. They are mere releases from pain. They are indeed. And does not the same hold for the anticipatory pleasures and pains that arise from our expectations of these? The same indeed. Now, do you know what qualities they have and what they most resemble? What? Do you think that, that in nature there is an up, a down, and a middle? I do. Now, do you think that someone being carried from below towards the middle would think he is being carried upwards? Could he think otherwise? <clears throat> and once he is standing in the middle and looking back to where he had been carried from, would he not presume without question that he is above, never having seen the truly above? By Zeus, I really do not think a person in such a position could think otherwise. And if he were carried back again, would he think he was being carried down? And would that be true? How could it not be? And would not all of this happen because he has no experience of what is truly above, in the middle and below? Obviously. And would you be at all surprised if people who in like manner, have no experience of the truth about many other matters, hold unsound opinions. Might they hold a view of pleasure and pain, and the intermediate state according to which, when they move in the direction of pain, they think they really and truly are in pain. But on the other hand, when they move to, from pain to the intermediate state, might they be convinced that they are approaching fulfillment and pleasure? And being deceived by comparing the absence of pain to pain without any experience of pleasure as if they were comparing black to gray with no experience of white. <clears throat> by Zeus, he said, I would not be surprised. No, I would be much more surprised if this did not happen. Well, think about this, said I. Are not hunger and thirst and the like a sort of deficiency in the state of the body <clears throat> indeed and are not ignorance and stupidity in turn a deficiency in the state of the soul very much so and would not anyone who gets nourishment or who acknowledges intelligence be filled up of course and does the true filling up involve being filled with what is less real or more real with what is more real of course and which of the kinds do you think partakes of more of pure being? Is it the kind that includes food, drink, relish, and every kind of nourishment? Or the form that includes true opinion, knowledge, intelligence, and in short, all excellence? You need to decide the following question. Does that which holds to the unchanging, to the immortal, and to truth, and is like this itself, and originates in something like this, seem more real to you than what holds to the ever-changing and the mortal and is like this itself and originates in this sort of thing whatever holds to that which is unchanging far exceeds the other now does the being of an unchanging partake any more of being than of knowledge not at all or of truth not of truth either and what partakes less of truth also partakes less of being, does it not? Necessarily. So, in general, 
They're not the kinds that are concerned with the care of the body, partake less of truth and being than those that are, that are concerned with the care of the soul. Much less. And do you not think the same holds for the body itself in comparison with the soul? I do, indeed. So, is not that which is filled with what is more real, <clears throat> and is itself more real, actually filled to a greater extent than something filled with what is less real, and is itself less real? It must be. In that case, if being filled with what naturally belongs to us is pleasure, then that which is filled more with things that are really are would make us enjoy true pleasure and more really and more truly. But that which shares in things that are less real would be filled less truly and less certainly and would share in a pleasure that is less trustworthy and less true. This must be so. So, so those with no experience of wisdom or excellence who are constantly involved in feasting and the like are, it seems, moving downwards and then back to the middle again. And they spend their lives wandering like this. They have never transcended this and turned their gaze to what is truly above. Nor have they ever yet been born there. Nor have they ever really been filled with what is or tasted pleasure that is certain and true. Rather, like cattle, <clears throat> like cattle with a constant downward gaze and their heads bowed toward the ground, to their tables they gorge themselves, feeding then mating, and out of sheer greed for all of this, they kick and butt one another with horns and hooves of iron. They slaughter one another with weapons of war, because their, desi their desire is insatiable, since they are not failing, filling the real part of themselves with things that are, nor are they even filling the part that can contain these. Socrates, you are describing most people's lives in an utterly prophetic manner. Now, is it not inevitable that they live among pleasures that are mixed with pains, more images and shadow drawings of true pleasure, taking their color from being placed out alongside one another so that they each appear quite intense? and engender raging passions of their own in senseless people, who fight over them just as the heroes at Troy, according to Stesichorus, fought over the image of Helen in ignorance of the truth. Yes, something like this is quite inevitable. What about this? Must not similar considerations apply to the spirited part? Whenever someone satisfies this, either through envy because he loves honor, or through violence because he is ambitious, or through spirit because he is bad-tempered. Is he not then pursuing the satisfaction of honor, victory, and spirit in the absence of calculation, reason, and intelligence? This sort of thing is inevitable, too, in that case. Well, then, may we be so bold as to say that in the case of the ambitious, profit-loving part, there are a number of desires that adhere to knowledge and reason, which pursue their pleasures in the company of these, only adopting the pleasures that intelligence approves of. Will not these desires adopt the truest pleasures they can attain to, because they are following truth itself and pleasures that belong to themselves? If indeed what is the best for each is if indeed what is the best for each is what most belongs to each. Yes, what most belongs to each indeed. So, the entire soul follows the lead of the part that loves wisdom without being rebellious, and each part, as a result, performs its own functions in every respect and is just. Then, above all, each does, above all, does each reap a rich harvest of pleasures that are its own, the very best the very best pleasures, and the very truest of which it is capable. Yes, precisely. But when any other part is in control, it is unable to, as a result, to discover its own pleasure, 
and it compels the others to pursue an untrue pleasure that is alien to them. Quite so. And would not the parts that stand farthest from philosophy and reason be most inclined to bring this about? Yes, they would be the most inclined by far. And whatever stands furthest from reason is furthest from law and from order? Of course. And did not the passionate and tyrannical desires prove to be the ones that stood at the furthest remove? Yes, they stood at the furthest remove by far. And the kingly and orderly desires stood closest. Yes. Then I suppose the tyrant will stand furthest away from those pleasures that are true and are his own, while the king will stand closest. That is necessary. Then the tyrant will live the least pleasant life, while the king will live the most pleasant one. This must be so. Now, do you know how much less pleasantly the tyrant lives in comparison with the king? Oh, what if you told me? <laughs> there are, it seems, three pleasures. One that is genuine and two that are fake. The tyrant has gone beyond fake pleasures into another realm. Fleeing from law and reason, he lives with a bodyguard of slavish pleasures. And it is not at all easy to say how much worse off he is, except perhaps in the following way. How? The tyrant, I believe, was at a third remove from the oligarchic type, and the democratic man was in between them. Yes. And if what we said previously is true, will he not live with an image of pleasure that is at a third remove, in terms of truth, from the oligarch's pleasure. Quite so. And yet, the, the oligarchic type is, again, at a third remove from the kingly type. And if we designate the aristocratic and kingly types as the same. A third indeed. So, the tyrant stands three times three in number removed from true pleasure. So it appears. In that case... The image of pleasure that the tyrant has, numerically in terms of length, would it seem to be a square? Precisely. And by squaring and cubing, it is obvious what the extent of the interval becomes. Of course, to a mathematician anyway. And if someone does this the other way around and tries to say how far the king stands from the tyrant, in terms of the truth of their pleasure, he will find on completing the, completing the calculation that the king lives 729 times more pleasantly while the tyrant lives more wretchedly by the very same interval. That's interesting. Let me write that down. 729. 729. Yes, you have, said he poured forth a massive string of calculation in the difference between these two men the just and the unjust in relation to pleasure and pain. Yes, and it is also a true number, appropriate to their lives, if days and nights, months and years are indeed appropriate to them. But of course they're appropriate. Now, if the good and just man wins out over the bad, unjust man, to this extent, in terms of pleasure, <clears throat> will he not win out to an enormously greater extent in the refinement of his life, and in terms of beauty and excellence. Enormously indeed, by Zeus. So be it then. Since we have come to this part and point in the argument, let us go back to the initial statements that got us here. It was said, I believe, that acting unjustly is beneficial to the completely unjust man, provided he has a reputation for being just. Is this not what was said? It was indeed. Then, let us discuss this now with this proponent since we have come to an agreement on the power that acting unjustly and doing what is just each possesses. How? By fashioning an image of the soul in words so that the person proposing this may see for himself what he is talking about. What sort of image? An image like one of those creatures that are referred to in myths of old. Chimeria, Scylia, Cerebus, and certain others that are spoken of 
in which many forms have grown together and become one. So they say, then fashion a single form, the form of a complex, many-headed beast that has heads of wild and tame beasts, all in a circle, and is able to change all these and make them grow out of itself. This is, an, <clears throat> this is a task for an ingenuous craftsman. Nevertheless, since it is easier to fashion speech than wax or the like, let it be fashioned like this. Then fashion one other form, the form of a lion, and then the form of a man. And let the first be the largest by far, and the second, second largest. These are easier to fashion, said he. It is done. Then join these three together into one, so that still being three, they somehow grow together. They have joined, said he. Now fashion an image of one of them, round, fashion an image of one of them round about them all, on the outside. An image of a human being, so that anyone who is unable to see what is inside and sees only the external shell, it appears to be one creature, a human being. The, the surrounding shell has been fashioned, said he. Then, let us say to whoever maintains that acting unjustly is beneficial to this human being and is doing what is just is not advantageous, that he is really claiming that it is beneficial to a person to feed the complex beast well and make it strong and the lion too, in its entourage, while he starves his human part, and makes it so weak that it is dragged wherever either of the other two may lead it, and it leaves themselves to bite, fight with, and devour one another, rather than getting them accustomed to one another, or turning them into friends. Absolutely, that is just what someone who praises unjust actions would be advocating. Then again, would not someone who says that what is just is beneficial be maintaining that it is necessary to do and say whatever puts the inner human being most in control of the person, whatever ensures that the human part will attend to the many-headed beast, like a husbandman, by nurturing and taming the gentle elements, while preventing the wild ones from growing, making an ally of the lion nature and caring in common for them all and making them friends to one another and to itself. Is that not how it, it will nurture them? Yes, that again is exactly what someone who praises justice asserts. So, someone who praises justice would be speaking the truth in every respect, while someone who praises what is unjust would be speaking falsehoods. Indeed, from the perspective of pleasure or reputation or the benefit it confers, whoever praises justice is speaking the truth, and while someone who criticizes it is unsound in his criticism and does not even know what he is criticizing. Does not know it at all, in my view. Well, since he is not falling into error deliberately, let us persuade him by gently by asking him, Good man. Would we not say that whatever is regarded as noble or as disgraceful has come to be so for reasons such as these? Whatever is noble makes a savage part of our nature subject to the human part, or perhaps to the divine part, and whatever is disgraceful makes the gentle part a slave to the wild part. Will he agree or not? He will if he listens to me. Now, based on this argument, is there anyone who benefits from acquiring gold unjustly if, in getting the gold, he enslaves the very best part of himself to the most base part at the same time? Or, if in the process of getting gold, he enslaved his own son or daughter to wild and evil men? That would not benefit him no matter how much money he might get for it. But if he enslaves the most divine part of himself to the most godless and corrupt part, and shows no mercy. Is he not wretched as a result? And 
is he not accepting a gift of gold in return for much more terrible ruination than Ruthley experienced when she took a necklace in return for the soul of her husband? Much more terrible indeed, for I will answer your question on his behalf. Do you not think that this is why unrestrained behavior has long been criticized? Is it not because such behavior lets loose that horror, that huge, multi-form beast, beyond its proper measure? Of course. And willfulness and discontent are censured, are they not? Whatever they cause the lion-like, snake-like part to increase and intensify, beyond for all proportion? Very much so. And luxury and softness are censured too, are they not? For loosening and relaxing the same aspect when they induce cowardice in it. Indeed. Are not flattery and servitude censured when someone puts the same spirited aspect and subjugation to the unruly beast and degrades the lion, all for the sake of money, to fulfill the beast's insatiable desires, getting it accustomed from its earliest years to be more of an ape than a lion. Indeed so. And why do you think lowly manual labor is subject to reproach? Or is it simply because it is associated with someone whose very best part is, by nature, weak, so that he is unable to rule the beast within himself, fosters them instead, and is unable to understand anything else except how to flatter them? So it seems. Now, so that such a person may be ruled by something similar to what rules the best person. Are we to say that he should be a slave of that best person who is ruled by the divine element? And we should not adopt Thrasymachus's view that a slave would be ruled to his own detriment. <clears throat> Do we not think it best that everyone be subject to divine wisdom, preferably residing within himself, or else established us externally so that we may all be as much alike as possible and friends too because we are all governed by the same thing and rightly so and the law being the ally of everyone in the city makes it clear that it also intends something of this sort this is also the purpose of the authority we exercise over children not allowing them to be free until we have established a system within them like the system of our government in our city, and by caring for their best part with the best part in us, we instill guardians and rulers in them, simply to our own, and then proceed to set our children free. Yes, that is clear. In which case, Glaucon, how, and based upon what argument, can we maintain that acting unjustly or without restraint or doing something shameful is a benefit to anyone, when he will actually be a worse person as a result, despite having a bit more money and power. We cannot maintain this at all. And is acting unjustly, escaping detection and avoiding punishment, beneficial in any way? Or does not someone who escapes detection become even more degenerate, while in the case of someone who does not escape and is punished, his Brutish part is made calm and gentle, and his gentle part is set free. His entire soul is restored to its very best state and attains a more honorable condition because it has acquired sound mindedness and justice, accompanied by understanding. Indeed, to the extent that soul is more honorable than body, soul attains more honorable condition than a body that has acquired strength and beauty along with health. Entirely so. Now, will not any intelligent person live his life with all his resources directed to this end, respecting, first and foremost, the branches of learning that will make his soul like this, and showing no respect for any others? Of course. Then, he does not give over the condition of the body, or its nurture, to brutish and rational pleasure, and turn his life in that direction. Nor does he look to its health or attach importance to being strong or healthy or beautiful unless he is going to become sound-minded as a result. Rather, 
He is always to be found attuning the harmony of his body for the sake of the concord of his soul. Yes, entirely so. If he is going to be a magician in truth. And will he not also bring this order in concord to his acquisition of wealth? Will he not increase the sheer size of his fortune beyond all bounds and his troubles too? Because he is in the thrall of popular views on what he should be grateful for. No, I do not think he would. Rather, he will add to or expend his wealth while looking to and guarding the city within himself to the best of his ability. He steers his course in this way in case anything might disturb the elements within him through excess or deficiency of wealth. Yes, exactly. And when it comes to honors, looking to the same principle, he will willingly partake of and taste those that in, in his view will make him better. But he will flee from private or public honors that undo the proper order. In that case, if this is his concern, he will not wish to engage in civic affairs. By the dog he will, and the city within himself very much so, but probably not in his own fatherland, unless some good fortune intervenes. I understand that you are referring to the city we have now described and are founding, the one that is laid out in words, since I do not think it exists anywhere on earth. <clears throat> but perhaps a pattern is laid up in heaven for anyone who wishes to behold it and to find himself based on what he sees. And to make no difference whether it exists somewhere, or will ever exist, for he would engage in the affairs of that city alone, and of no other, quite likely. And so we end Book 9. Uh, again, there's not a whole lot for me to add to this, right? It is interesting to note that he is iterating once again that the only good ruler doesn't want to, has to be drug kicking and screaming from whatever he is already productive in his life doing to the management of his city or the larger government in general because that is what happened here at the end, right? <clears throat> he would be a good steward of his city, but he wouldn't want to be a steward of the greater governments. And that is true. Nobody that wants to be in government should be in government. It's only the ones who are drugged there, kicking and screaming from their homes and their productive lives by their constituents should be the ones to serve because they're the only ones doing it for the right reason, right? They're not doing it for the power. They're not doing it for the kickbacks. They're not doing it for any of that. They're doing that because they stand for what is right. And we need so many more people who stand for what is right that it is not even funny. We have fed the lion too long. We have not fed the men at all. And when I say we, I don't mean me. Because as for me and my household, we serve the Lord. And because of that, I have raised up children who are fruitful. Right? They are just beginning their lives, but they are beginning their lives. And they are fruitful in their efforts. And that is all I can ask. I have raised up people who will stand up in the face of injustice whether or not that means bodily harm, whether or not that means the ultimate sacrifice. I have raised that up, so I get to say a few things. Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a somewhat difficult topic, right? There's not a whole lot for me to add because this is a good summation of what we should be doing. It, it is telling us to feed the good in us and to starve the bad. But not really even to starve the bed, to balance it. There's a need for a warrior in you. There is a need for a peacekeeper in you. At the same time, you should be a warrior in a garden, right? You should be growing and nurturing your own thing, but you should be fully capable of defending that own thing. The time may come when you need to. It may be sooner than you would believe. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, only complete, just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt State. Peace.